morning, everybody. It's uh, great to be back. I'm Tim Sandsbury. If I haven't met you, I've been uh, here at the church a few times, been involved, for, for those of you who do know, in various ways with, with Gavin since, uh, since really the very beginnings of New Springs. And it's my, uh, my pleasure, my honor to be able to, to be here this morning with you as we open up God's Word and continuing in the book of Genesis. I will say this, when, when uh, Gavin asked me, hey, you want to preach on Genesis 33, and I first read it, I thought, I know why he asked me to do this. Like, how do you build a sermon out of this? But then I thought, you know, if he was really trying to get me, he would have had me doing last week with like candy striped sticks, making sheep have different color babies. So I'm probably better off than that. But sometimes you may know, you may notice it's sometimes not easy to tell what we're supposed to get from scripture, especially when we're in these long story sections. A few weeks ago when I was here, I said, one of the things you're going to notice is There's not very many heroes here. If you go to the Bible and you're saying like, hey, I just want to read Genesis and I want to live just like those people. You're not going to have very many people that you think, oh, I really should live just like them. And Jacob, who's still going to be our star here, he's not been a moral star. He's not been a Jesus. He's been a broken guy. And we're going to see him being broken. Sometimes you go in like you're reading the Ten Commandments and it says, do not steal. And you think, okay, I know what that means. Do not steal. You know, or you're reading about Jesus and you see how he lived and you think, okay, I know I'm supposed to live like Jesus. But sometimes it's hard when we're in a long narrative to just, to just, to, to, to know what it is. God, what am I supposed to learn from this? What am I supposed to get from this? What am I supposed to pull out of this? So we're going to do a couple things this morning. The first thing is I'm just going to read all of Genesis 33. And, and because we're building out a story, because God gave us stories, the first thing we're going to do is just kind of talk a little bit about what happened in the story. But then, and this is kind of how I'd encourage you, if you're reading your Bible and you're thinking at first, God, I don't know what to do with this. Like, I don't, I'm, I'm sure I shouldn't be like Jacob, but I know you love Jacob and you took care of him. I, I know that this is part of your story. I know that from Jacob came Jesus generations and generations later. I know this is your story of how you saved us. So help me to know what to take from this. Help me to know what to learn from this. And so for us today, we're going to focus on just the beginning when we start doing that part. Like where, where, do, we, where do we walk away with something? And we're going to, we're going to see a, a pattern of anxiety in Jacob that comes from not believing God's promises that I suspect is going to be a lot like the anxieties we feel because we just don't trust God's promises. We're going to see an image of forgiveness That's a kind of forgiveness that's probably a challenge for us. And then the last thing that we're going to see is we're going to see a picture of God's forgiveness and how we ought to be coming to him versus how we normally do come to him and how much anxiety that can produce for us. So let's first, like I say, let's first just read this whole thing through. It's a story, so it's meant to be read as a story. Uh, the numbers, you may or may not know this. In fact, one of my professors said, sometimes, you know, when you have those chapter numbers, it's like the old uh, monk who was writing in the numbers. It's like the ox cart bounced and he put them in a weird place. Like those weren't there when this was written. They're to help you and me to find places. But this 33 to 34, we're just picking that because that's where it got put into our Bibles. It's not something that was there when it was originally done. We're jumping in the middle. And we're going to keep going. So let's jump in the middle here, um, starting in verse 1 of Genesis 33. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. And he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. And he put the servants with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And you may, if you, if you haven't been with us, remember the last time he saw Esau was when he had stolen Esau's blessing. And Esau said, once we're done mourning my father, I'm going to kill you. And he ran away to another country. So this is where he's coming in to his brother who the last word he's had from him is I'm going to kill you. And he was the big, the real big brother. Jacob was the little guy. He's kind of described as being mousy. Esau is described as being the powerful, outdoorsy, like manly man, um, rough, brutish. And so e- uh, Jacob is scared. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and children, he said, who are these with you? Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the servants drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. 
Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew near and they bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, please. If I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. Thus he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us journey on our way, and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail, and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord and see her. So Esau said, let me lead with you some of my, the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to see her. But Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padam Aram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Let's pray. Father, as we continue to look into the story of redemption uh, in Genesis through your, your people, your people like Jacob and Joseph, who starts to make an appearance here, the, the, the Rachel and Leah, the, the people through whom you built your kingdom of Israel, the people through whom you brought us our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we read this story and don't always know what to do with it, that you'll open our eyes to be able to see um, pictures not only of your work, your gracious work through broken people, but also to see images of what you've done for us in the cross and, and how you use us as broken people as well. Lord, in the end, open our eyes to the gospel. Remind us of how much you love us and the work that you've done in saving us. And let us be called into a life here in this world as broken people serving you that others could come to know you as well. In your name we pray. Amen. So the story here is a little bit straightforward. A couple of pieces that are a little bit weird. So we'll just talk about the whole thing to advance the story. So if you remember, if you've been here for a while, you may remember this comes right after Jacob has wrestled with God. And he got his new name, Israel. It's the first time the name Israel is something that we hear. And it's after Jacob had run away, probably for about 20 years, run away from home to get away from Esau. He's coming back. He's had promises from God that he's going to be able to come back and live in Canaan. He's coming back, but he's scared of Esau. And so last week, probably maybe the week before that, you, you may, have, may have read the parts of the story where he starts sending out the servants and the herds as he's coming. He's gotten rich. He's wealthy. It's not wealthy like us, like most of our wealth fits in like our phone in our pocket. Um, his wealth took fields and you had, to, you had to carry it with you. You had to feed it. You had to take care of it. And it would have been like a village to us that, that would be under a person. It would, it, would, it would be Jacob's village almost that's traveling. So livestock, people, families, it wouldn't have just been his family. This would have been like Jacob. So what he does is he breaks it all up into pieces and he sends, you know, one of the, one of the sets of herds out and some servants. And the, when they run into Esau, they're supposed to say, hey, this is a gift from your brother Jacob. Um, and he's right behind us. And then there's another group and it's like, oh, he's right behind us. And there's another group. He's right behind us. I mean, he's basically trying to bribe Esau into being okay with him. So we have the beginning, which is where we're going to focus, where Esau actually comes to meet his brother Jacob. And then if you read through the rest of it, it isn't like everything was good then. In fact, there's, there's a lot of argument. If you, go, if you go look at commentaries on this, it's not entirely clear what's happening in the second part. Because, right, Esau says, hey, come with me to Seir. And later on, Seir, that name, you'll, you'll, um, that, that's the country of Edom. And if you read in the prophets, Edom is one of the opponents often of Israel. It's one of the, uh, many of the prophecies in the prophets are against Edom because they're fighting against God's people, their opponents. Esau and Jacob continue to struggle. Generations later, their people are still struggling against each other. But Esau's like, hey, that's great. I'm so glad you're here. Why don't you come with me to my land? 
And Jacob's like, ah, you know, I, we can't walk that fast. You go on ahead. And Esau's like, well, I'll leave you some of my people and they'll go with you to my land. And Jacob's like, no, look, you go on ahead and I'll meet you there. And then he doesn't go there. He goes to Canaan where God had promised him a place to live. The text doesn't really tell us whether that was deceptive between the two of them. It doesn't really tell us whether uh, maybe Jacob went later to meet his brother. Maybe he was still being Jacob the liar. Maybe they really did recover. We don't really know. We don't really know. But what we do know is Jacob and Esau met. And in continuing the story, Jacob finally, after all of this time, he finally is back in the land, that land of Canaan that's eventually going to become Israel, the land that God had promised him. So as you just hear the narrative story, hear this, whether it was all positive, all negative, all the craziness that's happened, God promised, actually way before this, even in Abraham, God promised, I'm going to make a nation out of you. I'm going to make a people out of you, and I'm going to give you this land to be your land. And through crazy, knuckle-headed nonsense, outright deceit, people being jerks, arrogance, the family being broken, God still worked his good purposes. And now here he's fulfilled his promise and brought Jacob into the land that he had promised for him. So that's a, that's a big piece of the narrative story to hear. But now we get to this, we get to this question, like as you're reading, okay, I'm getting the story, but what can I, what can I take away? Right? If, I, if we just came up here, it would feel really weird to me. It would not go along with any of the classes I took. If all I did in, on a Sunday morning was just tell a story and then go on. Like there's no place in here that says, so this is what you should learn from this. So this is how you ought to behave. This is what you ought to do. We don't see that there. But what, what can we gather? And that's where I really do want to focus in on this beginning. And also even thinking before what we had today with Jacob sending all of these, all these parts and pieces of what he owned along ahead of him, sending on the servants. And there's some things you should really look down on this, like sending out the livestock ahead of time. Like it's going to kill somebody, kill them. It's going to take somebody, take them. If I'm going to get a warning, you know, maybe one of them make it back and say, yeah, don't come here. You know, and even Jacob hanging back behind his family, and he even shows favoritism until he orders the family. There's not a lot to learn there, obviously, in terms of, hey, that's the way we ought to behave. But let's see what we can learn. And so I want to I wanna start us off with the idea of anxiety. And maybe you can think about a time that you really destroyed a relationship. Just think about a time that you really destroyed a relationship, and you know you messed it up. Jacob messed it up. The time you destroyed a relationship, and now imagine if you had to, because I think what we tend to do when we do that is like run away. But now imagine if you had to come back and that person had power over you and how you would feel going into that relationship. Let's, let's reread this beginning. So this is the beginning 33-1, and thinking about now, I'm about to see this person that I have so badly wronged. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So now you're not, just, you're not just going to see this person you've harmed. You're going to see him, and they've got an army, and you got just you, and 400 men with him. So he divided, divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times, until he came near to his brother. Can you feel, can you feel in this the anxiety? Think about, think about Jacob's walk. He has been gathered. He's, he's running away from his father-in-law. That was nerve-wracking. He left in the middle of the night. His father-in-law caught up to him. He thought his father-in-law was going to attack him. His father-in-law said, God told me I wasn't allowed to, which isn't really like, it kind of says, like, I wanted to. Like I was going, like I, I, this is not how I want to be treating you. But God said I couldn't come out. I couldn't do anything bad to you. They get challenged on what's happened and there was some theft that happened there. So he's just left. It was a bad start to the vacation. You know, you start to get ready to get in the car and everything's gone wrong and the kids' bags aren't packed right. The, father, the in-laws are after you and mad at you. Now you finally got on the road and as you're coming towards your destination, you're gonna be meeting the other part of your family where your relationship is even worse. You're terrified. You're sending stuff out in front of you. Now you see in the distance that, that member of your family that you've heard so much that you now need to have to take care of you 
You're going to set the kids up. You're going to set the the wives, hopefully, is not a part that you identify with, up, and you're going to be walking out and bowing to the ground. Now, this may have been as much as like almost doing, is it burpees, right, where you're dropping all the way down? Like I, it's, it's not clear what that means, but it may very well have mean he almost laid in the dirt seven times as Esau is coming, doing everything he can to say, don't kill me. Just don't kill me. He's overwhelmed with anxiety. Now, maybe you, like me, identify with that. I mean, this is the guy he stole. He stole his blessing. He basically cheated him. When I was here last time, we were talking about he cheated him out of his birthright. I mean, Esau was in on that one. He was hungry. So basically took probably a third of his inheritance just for a bowl of soup. He was favored by his mother the whole time. He's been a cheat. He's been a sneak. He's been a liar. And he is scared, and I identify with that. But, but then think about this as you read the story. See, I identify with that humanly, but how many promises has Jacob gotten that this is going to go okay? If you've got time this week, you may want to go back and look at these. These are just some of the promises. Before Jacob was born, before Jacob was born, there was a prophecy. Hey, God's going to take care of you and build a kingdom out of you. While Jacob was alive, God came to him. He's just wrestled with God, and God has said, I'm going to make you Israel. Through his family, he has gotten promises. Directly through God, he's gotten promises. When he was with his uh, brother-in-law, he got God's promises, God's blessing. God continued to say, if, if you're good, I'm going to do good with you? No. Actually, over and over again, even when Jacob was a jerk, even when Jacob was evil, God said, I'm going to do good with you. But Jacob is overwhelmed with anxiety because he has forgotten God's promises. When we read a story like this, we often think, well, if I had promises like that, I wouldn't be so anxious. If I, if God had really, if God came into me and did that stuff, I wouldn't be so anxious. And we can kind of wonder at these biblical people. And one of the things we can do wrong sometimes is think, what's wrong with them? Like if I'd interacted with God that way, there's no way I would fall apart. But you know what? That's one of the best examples. That's one of the best things about these stories in Scripture. Remember what the disciples did when Jesus got arrested? Every one of them ran away. I'm so glad it was every one, because you know what we'd all be doing? If all but one of the apostles had run away, what would we all be doing? That would have been me. I would have been that one. Like, that would have been me. Right? We do that stuff. But every single one ran away. One of the things that we should gain from Scripture is, yes, it's true, Jacob should not have been anxious. But he was. And we will be too. And what you can do is not say, if I become a good Christian, I won't be anxious anymore. What we do is we go back to God's promises and we remember that, hey, God's people have all gotten scared. But we have to grab hold of God's promises and continue forward. And that is one of the pieces we can look at with Jacob. As scared as he was, he did press on. He did go to the land that God had called him to. And so I want to just kind of remind us. I think it's good for us to be reminded of some of God's promises. The first one, this is one of the most beautiful promises about anxiety in Scripture. And it's Matthew 6. If you're not familiar with it, if it's not one, I mean, this is a great one to have just rooted in your heart so that when that anxiety takes over for you like it did for Jacob, you've got a place to go back to to say, wait a minute, I remember what God said. And so here it is, Matthew 6. I'm going to read it. It's a little bit on the long side, but I, as I tried to cut it down, I was like, you just, I, I can't cut this. This is too good. So let's read this starting in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? 
For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, have you ever been overwhelmed by anxiety and had somebody say, you just need to relax? Just relax. Does that work, Does that work really well for you? Even in your own heart, does it work really well? What, is, what does this verse say? It does say, relax, don't be anxious. But, but notice, it kind of gives us a message at the end. Look, seek the kingdom. You're, you're, Jesus is not saying this to an audience that isn't anxious. He's saying this to an audience like us that is anxious. But he's reminding us, I got it. In terms of what you need, you seek the kingdom, and I will take care of you. It may not always be pretty. Jesus' life was not pretty. Jesus' life was not easy. It was not fun. It didn't lack in suffering. It doesn't mean that. If what you want is a life with no suffering, okay, then be anxious. If what you want a life is a life of wealth, if what you want is a life of no doubts or fears, oh, okay, well, then in that case, be anxious. But what this says is like Jacob was effectively being told like, okay, go to Canaan. That's where you got to go. You're anxious along the way, keep going. He, he, he could have behaved with more faith. He didn't, but he kept going. To us, this verse says, keep going, and then we remind ourselves, hey, God promises he's got this. He promises he's going to take care of me. He promises that he's going to work through even the trials and the sufferings and the tribulations that I have. I need to seek his kingdom, not be worried about myself first. And I can trust it is there even when I don't feel it. His promise is there even when I don't feel it. And that's what we can say to each other. Don't say relax, just calm down. If you were really a believer, you wouldn't feel this way. But you could say this, hey, listen, I know you're going through some horrible times right now. And if you haven't been through horrible times yet, they're coming. It's all through the Psalms. When you've been through them, what you can say to people is, I've been there. And God's promises are good. And he'll get you through this. And we'll be there with you. We'll be there together. Remember God's promises that they can help you to say, I'm going to seek the kingdom like Jacob needed to seek Canaan and keep moving on. But here's the, here's the next thing that happens. And I'm going to skip. We can, you can skip too because the Philippians text, which is beautiful, I think we've kind of covered it well enough uh, for the sake of time. Let's, let's go to the picture of forgiveness. Um, this is really interesting what happens with Esau. Esau has been given all of these gifts, but it's not like he says, thank you for all these gifts. I'm going to run up. What, is, what happens with Esau? This is right after Jacob is bound to the ground seven times. Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. This is an utterly unexpected embrace. This is not what Jacob expected. Remember the last time he saw Esau, Esau wanted to kill him. He said, I'm just going to wait till the mourning period is done. Like not at the funeral, but once the funeral's over, like once we're done with all the official taking care of family, then that guy is dead. His mom ran him out, like, let's get him, let's get you taken care of. Remember, mom favored Jacob, said, Jacob, we got to get you. Your brother's going to kill you. We got to get you out of here. And he ran away for all this time. He probably left behind all of the inheritance and everything that he'd stolen. He probably went away basically empty, maybe a couple camels worth of some stuff. But Jacob probably lost all that stuff that he had gained inappropriately. Now he's been gone for like 20 years and he's coming back. So he sends all the gifts out and Esau walks right by him. Esau shows up with power. 400 people is a lot of people. Back then, like, th this is not, this is an impressive entourage. Like this, you don't even fit in the nightclub with your entourage when you got 400. Like this is a big crew, and it's probably folks that are pretty rough looking, pretty tough looking, pretty dangerous looking that are coming up. And then, and Jacob is like, all right, this is it. This is when I die. Let's see if I can just keep him from killing me. And Esau just comes up and grabs him and embraces him. If we think about the pattern of Jacob's betrayals, Esau's anger, Jacob's offerings, maybe you could say, maybe you would humanly think, maybe you would humanly think, all right, Esau's going to say, I'll take it. 
This is this is this is what you got. I'll take everything you got. We'll call it even on everything you stole from me. I can't believe you came back here, but you're my brother. So you go live over there, I'll live over here, and I won't try to kill you anymore. Maybe you could maybe a little more than that. Maybe with all the offerings, but humanly speaking, this is not what we would expect. Probably what we want. I wouldn't dream of that from somebody that I had harmed in this way. I wouldn't dream of them forgiving me in this way. Jacob's anxiety is well fitted, but this is a picture of what forgiveness ought to look like. And now I'm going to ask us to flip the seat. Now you be the Esau. Now you be the person who was dreadfully wronged, dreadfully wronged by somebody who has now sent out gifts, but not clearly behaved with good character towards you. Sent out gifts to try to say, don't kill me. They're in fear. They, are, they have dreadfully wronged you. You are on the other side. How do you respond? Can you be Esau? Can I be Esau? Can we not only say, all right, you've given me enough, we'll call it even. Or you stay over there, I'll stay over here, and we understand, I understand we're, we're all Christians here, or we're all family here, we've got the same last names, so we've got to get along at Christmas. But to grab hold of him, to grab hold of her, to grab hold of the person who has wronged you that way, and even when they still seem to be low character people, to weep, to weep and say, I forgive you. That is an unexpected embrace. We don't know what was going on in Esau's heart. We don't know exactly what was happening. We don't know how they felt long term. We know that the countries were still, they were prophesied to be in battle. We know they still fought against each other over time. We know Jacob didn't actually go home with Esau. We don't know all the story, but we have a picture there that should be a picture for us. The kind of forgiveness that we ought to offer, even to those, I mean, this is, it doesn't get much worse. Jacob stole his inheritance. He, he tricked him, stole his mother's love. He tricked him out of uh, the other part of inheritance. He, he was constantly lying, conniving, stole his father's blessing, stole his father's affections. I mean, this was a broken relationship. And Esau says, I'm, I'm so glad you're home. He wept. He grabbed his brother and he wept. And he said, I don't need those gifts. Now, some of that interplay there, he does end up with the gifts, but that's, that's probably an old culture and the way they did, you know, the sort of like the shame culture that would have existed at that point in time. But he doesn't forgive him after, it, he doesn't forgive him after Jacob has done what needed to get done. He forgives him beforehand. He forgives him on the basis of brotherhood. And we can forgive on the basis of brotherhood and sisterhood. This should be a model to us of that kind of forgiveness. But now I want to move and think about this in a different term because there's, a, there's another picture in the New Testament that's very similar to this restoration. I don't know if it comes to mind right away. If you want to go to the next slide, I don't know if it comes to mind right away. But remember the, pro the story of the prodigal son? How does the father come back to the son? Now, this one, the story of Esau and Jacob, is two people. It's not a parable. It's, it's a real-life story with all the brokenness. The prodigal son, this is Jesus trying to teach us about what it's like when he is restored to us, when we've run away, when we've destroyed things, when we've taken our inheritance. Remember, the son goes to the father and says, Dad, you know, when you die, I'm going to get a third of your land as a younger brother. I'm going to get a third of your stuff. Why don't you give it to me now? He basically says to him, I wish you were dead. I want the benefit. The, your, your life is not a benefit to me. Your stuff is a benefit to me. I want all the stuff now, and I want to go live my life. He takes it. He treats them. I mean, it's, it is, it is an, it, impossible for us to understand how badly that would be to treat somebody because of what this meant within the family structure. It really was saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. And he takes it and he squanders it all. He lives a horrible life. He runs away. He destroys the relationship. He's left his family behind. He blows it on prostitution. He blows it on parties. He ends up serving pigs and says, you know, I'm going to go back to my dad. And I'm just going to like, maybe he'll let me be a servant in the house. And what does his dad do? His dad, and this is, we don't get this either today, but it's actually shameful. His dad like picks up like the robe. He kind of girds when you see that language of girding. Robes aren't good for running in. They're good for falling down in. They're not good for running in. So you have to kind of gird them up. You had, to, you had to pull them up. And it was considered shameful to run. 
So the dad picks it up and he runs and he, just like this with Esau, he grabs him and he embraces him and he loves him. See, one of the things that the picture there shows is not that the son sent out and he had his plans, right? He was doing like Jacob. He was thinking in his mind, all right, I'm going to tell my dad I've, I've messed everything up. And he, he tries to go through this. I'm going to tell him I'll just be a servant. He's going to try to make it up to him. He's going to try to fix it. He's got a plan to fix it. And what does dad do? He just embraces him. See, I think for us, whether you know Christ already or you don't, often we think forgiveness works like Jacob does. And that leads to a lot of the very same kinds of anxiety that Jacob felt. Some of you here may know Jesus, but may feel so alienated from him that what you're doing right now is kind of what Jacob was doing. You're trying to send out some good works ahead of time. You don't have sheep and goats that you're putting out in front. You're like, I can't be in relationship with you yet, God. Let me, let me I'm going to come to church, send that out. Hey, listen, 15 times in a row, haven't missed. Oh, 15 out of 16, doing pretty well. Like You send out some good work. Look what I did for the people in the community. Look what I did for my family. Look how I forgave those people. But you're, you're saying to God, like, I want to have relationship with you. I know I hurt you. I know I betrayed you. And I know you're angry. And God's anger is apparent in Scripture. The Old Testament, look, he is angry at sin. Sin produces anger in God. It is wrong. It is deep. It is we ought to be feeling like Jacob if we're walking away from God and we don't have his experience of, if we don't have that redemption, we ought to understand there is real, true anger at that betrayal. But where our anxiety will come in is if it's up to us, like Jacob thought it was up to him, I got to get back in relationship with God. So let me do some things. Let me get some stuff right. Let me, let me just send God enough sheep and goats, enough servants, enough pre-gifts, what I've done right. And then maybe he won't kill me. Then at the very end, I'll bow down in the ground. I'll go all the way down into the dirt. I'm going to destroy myself in front of him and maybe he won't kill me. See, if you want to do that, you're going to be stuck in anxiety. You're going to be destroyed by anxiety. It's never going to be enough. Even if you could send out enough gifts out in front for what you'd done before, you're not going to be able to cover what you did this week. Scripture doesn't have a picture of us being able to do things that make God owe us anything. There's nowhere all the offerings in the Old Testament, you know, not one of them ever is like, do it now and you're good to go for the next three weeks. They always take care of what we did in the past. It's one of the really interesting things. There's nowhere about earning some extra points to be able to get God beholden to us. It's all about getting him to forgive us for what we've done wrong. But what does God do when we come to him? He doesn't want us to send gifts out in front. He says, just come and say, God, save me. And then he says, I'm going to pick up my skirt. I'm going to humiliate myself and run to you. And where was that humiliation? Where was that humiliation and running to you? That was in Jesus coming down from heaven, taking on human, a human body, living as a human being, living perfectly, and then getting abused and destroyed by people like you and me, sent to the cross, even though he was innocent, where he took on all the sin, all the consequences, all the, all the guilt that we had. He took that on there. And he says, listen, I did it. No more sending out offerings. Just come to me. Just come to me, and I will embrace you. I will grab you by the neck. I will weep with you. That image of the Father is the image for us of how God wants to receive us. If you want to send out enough offerings to get God ready for you, be anxious. Be anxious like Jacob because there are no offerings that are big enough to cover what we need. But if you want to be set free from that anxiety, if you want to be able to embrace those promises that God made towards his people, then know this, you can't bring a thing. God brought it all, but he will weep with joy embracing you when you say, Lord, save me. If you don't know that saving grace now, then do it today. Don't wait to get it right. Don't send offerings out. Don't keep trying. Don't keep figuring. If I get my life a little better, eventually I'll be good enough to go to God. Go to God now. He will run to you now. 
And if you know him, but like so many of us over time, the struggle with sin, the continuing battle with our problems, the feelings that like Jacob destroyed his relationship with Esau, maybe you feel like you've destroyed your relationship with God. No, that's not true. In the cross, God said, I love you. You are mine. He embraced you. And when you turn away, and we all fall, but when you doubt that, when you doubt that love, it's like Jacob forgetting those promises. He promises, no, when you're mine, you're mine. Yeah, listen, you're mine. I want you to serve the kingdom. You're mine. I want you to live well. I want you to be in community. I want you to be people of dignity and honor and grace. I want you to reflect that love. But when you fail, you're going to fail. Just turn back to me, and right away, I will turn back to you. I didn't even turn away. We're going to feel anxious. We're going to forget God's promises. But we remind ourselves of God's promises in our anxiety. We can know He has promised that that relationship will never be broken. No more offerings. No more sending out the sheep out in, sheep out in front of us. God loves us. He loves you. If you're not one of his, turn to him now. If you're one of his, be reminded he has embraced you. He has wept at the reunion. He has paid the cost, and we can trust in his promises that he will not let us go. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your word when sometimes it's hard to know exactly what to take from it. Lord, we thank you for these images of the gospel, these images of the cross, these images of your redemption, your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for this image of being embraced despite our sin, being embraced where no gift could restore relationship. Lord, for, for all of us here today, maybe we're feeling the weight of the ways that we failed. We're feeling the weight of the way we can already tell we're going to fail again today. Just remind us not to send you gifts, but to turn to your embrace, to let you embrace us, to let you weep over us, to let you hug us, to let you say it's taken care of in the cross. And Lord, from there, send us out as people who know you and love you and want to see others come into this beautiful relationship, this beautiful embrace. Amen.